I'm used to dealing with blockages in the heart arteries. But the thing is, is that arteries are the same arteries throughout your body. So the same blockages that you might have in your heart are going to be the same blockages or risk that you have in your legs, and that's called peripheral arterial disease, or in the carotids, which are the arteries that bring blood to the brain, or in your, the brain arteries, which are also, um, when that starts getting uh, blocked, you start having mini strokes or TIAs or what they used to call hardening of the arteries a long time ago. So, and you might know people who have some mini strokes and, and uh, so again, that's something that it's the same arteries all through the body. Once you have problems in one area, it is highly likely you have problems in another area. So it turns out that about 30% of people who have heart blockages or arteries blocked in the heart actually have arteries blocked in the legs. And it's something that we don't talk about. And so that's why we thought this would be an interesting topic for tonight. So, so these are all the risk factors for arterial disease. Now, when you have blockages in the, let's, let's talk about blockages in the heart arteries. What do you think of this list? High blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, being sedentary, smoking or family history. Who, what do you think is the top one for blockages in the heart? So cholesterol. Cholesterol, mm -hmm. cholesterol turns out to be a big one. This guy is a good one. Uh, he's going to get a gold star. So it turns out. Now what about if you say for a stroke or blockages in the brain? What do you think of this list? Hypertension. Um, and what do you think about for blockages in the legs? No. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Diabetes. No. <coughs> like no. All of them. That's true. All of them are important, but the single leading one is actually smoking. Yeah. Really. So it turns out that for the heart, cholesterol is a really important risk factor for reducing stroke, high blood pressure is a, a really big risk factor, and for peripheral arterial disease, smoking is a big risk factor. And of course, um, this is a cutout of an artery, okay? <coughs> so you can see here that it takes a really long time, years, to build up enough plaque in any of your arteries until you have something that's completely blocked so that what happens is that when you walk, if you only have this much of the artery that can flow blood, when you walk, now if you, let's say you have a blockage in your heart, when you walk, what are you going to get? Shortness. Shortness of breath or? Angina. Angina, chest pain, right? Because what happens is when you walk, you increase your heart rate, you increase the demand on your heart, and what happens is your heart can't meet that demand. Now let's say that you have this, and you have blockages in your legs. You start walking, what's going to happen with the legs? Cramp, pain. right, pain. And what happens is you get that pain in the back of your legs. Ooh, Charlie horse. So you stop for a minute, gets better, and you start walking again. That's what's called claudication, or arterial disease in the legs. And <coughs> So I already told you that the single biggest risk factor for claudication is smoking, right? So how many people know how Virginia Slims came to be known? So it turns out women weren't supposed to smoke. So Virginia Slims wanted to capture that market, the women smoking market. So they designed an extremely thin cigarette, extremely thin models, because they found out that women who smoke actually lose weight. So they wanted to encourage women to, stop, to start smoking to maintain thinness. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete scam, but it's true. And so that's why they named it Virginia Slims. They started sponsoring all these um, uh, athletic competitions for women, the tennis tournaments, et cetera, and that's how they got women to stop smoking. So the, the, the campaign was, you've come a long way, baby. And that was to encourage women to be liberated and free, and they're going to smoke. So then it graduated and became Virginia Slims, it's a woman thing. It's stupid. Why do we apply mascara at 55 miles per hour? Because we can. I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with smoking. It's dangerous. On the other hand, so smoking. So, um, 
so I, I think I just bring that up to say to you, please, if there's one thing you can do for your heart, for your legs, for your brain, stop smoking. And so it's, it's they built a multi-billion dollar business on this thing. It, you know, let's not contribute to it. Diabetes is the next risk factor that's really important when you're talking about problems with your legs. The leading cause of amputation for blockages in the legs is diabetes. Leading cause in this country is diabetes. Is, and Dr. Um, my colleague, Dr. Kalapadabu, will talk to you about the fact that a lot of times we do surgery to open up arteries and to try and relieve it, but sometimes people wind up having a toe amputated or, God forbid, a limb amputated, and that's because they don't have diabetes controlled. So again, people know your A1C, know your fasting glucose, normal is 100. Diabetes doesn't get to 126. So between 100 and 126 is pre-diabetes. So really emphasizing the importance that when you're at that pre-diabetes stage, it's time to take a good look at your diet and exercise and turn it around. I tell patients, limit the white things. Bread, rice, potatoes, pasta, sugar, and add more colors, blue, green, yellow, orange, purple, to your diet. And what about getting overweight? Well, we're getting overweight for a reason. Too much of this stuff and too little exercise. So um, this is, somebody sent me a picture of a Texas taco. I gave a talk in Texas, and this is a Texas taco. It's like some kind of wrap that you eat for breakfast with sausage and eggs and all sorts of things. Now this is a picture that someone gave me of a heart attack or a blocked artery. And you can see that the two of them don't look that much different, right? <laughs> You are what you eat. And exercise today, and we're going to talk a lot about how, believe it or not, walking, if you have blockages in your legs, if you walk, you can actually build arteries and other pathways for the blood to go to your legs. So what, remember we talked about the walking, ooh, cramps in the legs? Don't just turn around and go home. Keep walking. Let it rest for a minute and keep walking because what's going to happen and you're going to build these helper arteries. Now this guy is walking his dog, and that is not what we mean. And you can say that that's, uh, that's the, uh, this is uh, exercise today. Not, we don't exercise as much as we used to. And this is interesting. This is a picture of people taking the escalator to the gym. And uh, that is not exercise. Take the stairs. What do I tell people about diet and exercise? It says here, eat less and exercise more. That's the most ridiculous diet I've heard of yet. And it is true. Uh, unfortunately, it is calories in and calories out. And there is no other way around it. This guy's a good example of heart disease. Um, so he's had bypasses. He's had stents. He's a big advocate now for the American Heart Association. And he tells us, one in four Americans in this country, one in four, have high blood pressure. Now, how many people in this room, if one in four, or more than four people here, someone should have high blood pressure? So raise your hand. I have it too, right? I look pretty, I look like I shouldn't have it. But you can't tell, it's a silent disease. My mom has it, my dad has it, my sister has it. I wasn't surprised. But um, again, you know, being careful, watch the salt, not too much on the salt, try to be active, and maintain your weight, and most importantly, take your blood pressure medicine. If you don't like it, if it causes you problems, if you have poor sexual drive, if you have tiredness, if you have anything, tell your doctor. There's a hundred blood pressure medicines. We'll change it. And again, know the numbers. If, does everyone here know what a normal blood pressure is? What's the top number supposed to be? 120. I love 120, but you got to be l at least less than 140. But 120 is the number that I love. What's the bottom number supposed to be? 80. This guy is good. I'm going to take you upstairs. We're going to start working. What's the difference between the, you know, the systolic and the... Right. So it used to be that they said, well, the top number is not that important. It's only the bottom number that's important. The systolic number... And it, it represents the increase in um, stretch on the arteries, okay? It's systolic and diastolic. We now know that the top number is the hardest one to treat, but it's one of the most important, especially when you're looking at stroke risk. And the bottom number is just as important. For my gentleman friend here, 
who told me he wants his blood pressure to be 120. As the systolic or top number goes from 120 to 140, 120 to 140, your risk of a heart attack and a stroke doubles. Okay? You want 120 to be the number. And does everyone in here know their cholesterol? How many people know their cholesterol number? Uh oh, I see some bad stuff here. They don't know it. Know your numbers. There's some numbers you should know. You should know your weight. You should know your cholesterol. You should know your blood pressure. And you should know your fasting glucose, your sugar. Okay? You have to know those numbers. Now, I would send, do you know your shoe size? Okay. Do you, know, do you know your dress size? Do you know your bra size? Sure. Of course. <laughs> you, those things are so not important, but this stuff is really important. Really important. That's the numbers you got to know. I could order, I could order num shoes over the internet. I just plug in size six and a half. But I got to know my cholesterol as good as I know that number. It's the HDL. Which one is the cholesterol now? Okay, so LDL is your bad cholesterol. Okay. And I want that number to be low. That's how you remember L for LDL cholesterol. That's got to be low. H, HDL is your good cholesterol, and you want that to be high. You want that to be a good number. What are the numbers? The, so it ranges between if you're just normal and no risk factors, we want LDL to be, let me go back. Whoops. If we want, if you're no medical issues, we want your LDL to be less than 130. If you have artery problems, coronary disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, this number needs to be between 70 and 100. Pretty low. You're not going to be able to get there with diet alone. Someone told me family history. It's important if your family has a history of heart disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, it's very important for you to know you're at risk. Just like I know that I'm at risk for high blood pressure. I knew it. It wasn't that surprising. Same for my husband. His father has it. His sister has it. His brother has it. No surprise that he decided that he was going to get it. But, you know, again, you just have to really focus on, um, on um, emphasizing. So this is a warm-up. I'm just telling you a little bit about what claudication or pains in your legs from artery problems are, and some of your risk factors. My name is uh, Dr. Kalap Parapu. I go by Dr. K. Keep it simple. Um, and uh, I'm a vascular surgeon, like uh, Dr. Spratt mentioned. Um, I'm going to talk to you. Um, there's going to be some overlap between what Dr. Spratt talked to you about and what my uh, slides are going to be. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it simple. Um, try to explain to you about peripheral arterial disease and um, how we diagnose it, um, what the symptoms are, and what uh, options are there for treatment. Okay. Feel free to ask questions uh, as we go. All right. So let's start with something very basic that I hear patients talk and ask me. So. What is an artery and what is vein? And I'm sure um, most of you know about it, but it's, it's good to go over it because uh, it's a, a fundamental thing in peripheral arterial disease. So arteries carry oxygenated blood, as in blood with, which is rich in oxygen from the heart to different parts of the body. Whereas, whereas veins carry blood that is deoxygenated, as, as in less oxygen, from different parts of the body back to the heart. So you see the arteries are in red. So they're going from the heart to different parts of the body, including the legs, brain, hands, everywhere. And, and the veins are in blue. So peripheral arterial disease, as the name would indicate, is the result of blockage in arteries that is going down towards, um, towards the leg. So what happens inside the body? And, and uh, Dr. Spratt had a beautiful slide showing you know, the different sections of the artery. And this is uh, essentially the same thing in a different uh, um, form. And here, this is the buildup of plaque. And this happens over time, over years and years. And as this slowly starts to build up, this is the lumen through which blood has to flow to get to wherever it has to get to, whether it's the you know, foot or the hand or wherever. So as this blockage gets worse and worse, 
this lumen of the blood vessel gets smaller and smaller. So again um, like Dr. Spratt mentioned earlier, peripheral arterial disease, blockages in arteries in the neck causing stroke and heart disease, they, they overlap with each other as in some patients uh, may have one or more of these conditions. So there is an overlap of uh, diseases uh, between, um, uh, between all three of them. So it's important to recognize or look for the other two diseases if you have one. So that's, um, uh, it's, it's the same disease process uh, everywhere in the body. Again, as we uh, learned earlier, this is a disease that becomes increasingly common as you grow older. Now having said that, um, we see patients who are even in their 30s and 40s sometimes with bad blockages. So what are the risk factors? We went over this a uh, few minutes ago, but again, um, same thing again, diabetes and smoking, very important, big risk factors. So in, in patients who have peripheral arterial disease, if you take 100 patients with peripheral arterial disease, about a third of them will actually have symptoms and we'll talk about what symptoms they're going to be. And uh, on the other hand, you could have about two thirds of patients without symptoms. So if you have risk factors, talk to your doctor and have your doctor examine you, look for peripheral arterial disease. So what are the symptoms? As um, Dr. Spratt mentioned, pain in the legs, right? So what are the different things that can cause leg pain? You can have pain from circulation, peripheral arterial disease, that's vascular. You can have pain from nerves. You've heard of patients having, you know, pinched nerves from the back, shooting pains down the leg, that's nerve pain, neuropathic pain, or pain from arthritis, or, you know, muscle pain. Okay, so what are the symptoms of peripheral arterial disease? So when you have pain in the calves, thighs, or buttocks with walking and relieved by rest, again, like we heard before, that's called claudication. To claudicate, it's a Latin word, means to limp. So it's, it's pain after you walk. It may be walking to your mailbox. It may be walking half a block, a block. It may be walking four blocks. You start feeling you know, discomfort that it forces you to stop. You have to stop. There's no, you can't walk through it. And then you wait for a few minutes, the pain goes away. That's classic vascular pain. And that's, and that's the beginning of the disease. As the disease progresses, as the blockages get worse, then you start having pain all the time and it starts in the foot. Usually worse at night because when you're sitting or standing, gravity lets the trickle of blood go down to the foot. So you know, it's not as bad, but once you lay flat and sleep, usually patients wake up in the middle of the night complaining of pain in the foot because once you're flat, then the, the health of gravity is gone. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When I lay down in the middle of the night or maybe an hour later. Right, right. And, uh, right. The, and, the, and, the, and that's a good point. Um, one of the things uh, you want to watch out for is like you get sometimes crampy pain in the calves in the middle of the night. That's not vascular pain. We're talking about pain in the foot that you almost have to massage the foot or get up and walk around or hang your foot off the bed and sleep. Or, and some patients... And they really hurt, they end up sitting on the couch and sleeping all night. So that's, that's classic vascular pain. And as the disease progresses further, then we start seeing black toes, discolored toes, ulcers on the feet. The, 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 the mass of muscle in the ankle or the foot is a lot lower than the muscle in the calf or the thigh. So usually the pain starts in the calf and the way the disease process goes. Now, very rarely you can have pain in the foot when you walk. But ankle, I would you know, make sure there's no problem with the ankle joint. Okay, so what happens to the disease over time? So imagine this is the blood vessel and this is the blockage. So the blood is going through there and that blockage is obviously um, decreasing the amount of blood flow down to the foot. And as, as Dr. Spratt mentioned earlier, at rest it may not cause pain, but when you start walking, your leg needs more blood because you know, it's exercising. There's muscles, you know, there, there's more demand. And this is going to, this blockage is going to prevent that amount of blood flow from reaching. And that's when um, muscle causes pain. So over time, this blockage then starts to get worse. So 
the amount of space now the blood vessel has to allow blood to go down to the foot is smaller. That's when you have rest pain, pain that you uh, have all the time. And as the disease gets even worse, tighter, 80, 90, 100% blockage, then we, that's when you start seeing ulcers. And you can slow it down if you change your lifestyle and um, you know, take care of the risk factors. There's blood pressure, smoking, start taking aspirin every day, control your diabetes, go for walks. And, and again, um, we will talk more about how to walk uh, and, uh, and to slow down the process. You can definitely slow down the process. There are patients who, when they make changes in their life, they can just stay here all their life. And, 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 and this is one of the favorite questions I ask medical students when we teach them at Penn is, if you have 100 patients with claudications, how many of them will actually lose their leg in the next five years? What percentage? It's actually a very small percentage, less than 5%. And these same patients, how many of them will have a heart attack over the next five years? That's a higher number, it's about 25, 30%. Mm -hmm. So again, if you go back to the original slide, there's an overlap between diseases. So it's important, even though you don't, you not have heart symptoms, if you have a problem with arterial disease and claudication, you should you know, have your heart doctor check you out. So blood clot is a, um, is a very kind of a general term. This is a, form, this is a blockage which you know, is also referred to uh, as a blood clot. But again, uh, but in medical terms, blood clot is a fresh blood clot that actually can be in a vein or an artery. So it's, uh, you know, it means different things uh, in different contexts. All right, so when the disease progresses, the, the point of tissue loss, then obviously this is, you know, you don't want to be in this stage, but um, that's advanced uh, peripheral arterial disease. So when you go to the doctor, uh, how, do, how is the diagnosis made? So a good history, so we talk to you, we ask you how your pain, you know, comes about and what makes it go away. When you have pain after, when you stand for a long time, that's not peripheral arterial disease. So it is a, if you get out of bed and you take the first step and you start hurting, that's not peripheral arterial disease. So the claudication is very classic. It's when you walk and then rest pain is classic. It's there all the time and, uh, and you know, by examining, checking your pulses, we can know how bad the disease is. Um, so between history and physical exam, uh, reasonably good diagnosis can be made by your physician. And then ultrasound, again, is a, I think uh, someone in the audience had an ultrasound report. So ultrasound is a very good way of uh, checking for a peripheral arterial disease. And um, further testing is sometimes done when uh, there's a plan for intervention. So this is what we do when we uh, do the ultrasound. So after the history and physical exam, this is what we call ABIs or ankle brachial index, where we put blood pressure cuffs around the ankle and up on the arm, just like checking your blood pressure, check your pressure on both, and try, and try to figure out how much blood flow is actually making down to the foot as compared to the arm. So there are some formulas that we use and uh, figure out whether you're getting adequate blood flow down to the leg. And once, if this shows you got significant peripheral arterial disease, then we go to the next step. Of course, this is again another ultrasound picture here showing blockages uh, in the artery. So uh, if all this is uh, pointing towards uh, a problem, then we go ahead and get a CAT scan looking at blockages. So that's the diagnosis. So what's the treatment? Get more blood flow. So the different uh, ways this can be done, there's medical treatment, Endovascular basically means it's a minimally invasive treatment that's been around for about 15, 20 years now, and every day the technology is changing. Um, uh, if either of these two don't work, then there's uh, surgical treatment. No matter what treatment is given, whether it's uh, you know, a tablet, a prescription, or a stent, or a surgery, you have to change your lifestyle. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing about smoking, and you know, um, like uh, Dr. Spratt mentioned earlier, smoking is the single most important um, risk factor in peripheral arterial disease is that in patients who continue to smoke despite receiving treatment, blockages come back. So I'm not going to go um, a lot into the medical treatment. Uh, Dr. Spratt talked about it, but again, the, the top three things that we have to do for um, medical treatment is stop smoking, stop smoking, and stop smoking. One, two, and three. It is, it is, it is that important. 
And, and the way I tell my patients, um, uh, the best way to stop smoking or, the, or, or my patients who have really succeeded in stopping smoking is stop cold turkey. Don't try to cut down on it. If you cut down on it, you almost, this, we all go through stresses in life. You cut down on it, you'll, there'll be some stressful situation or some event that you'll start going back up again. So just cold turkey, just throw it away, just say enough is enough. It has, you know, it has damaged your body enough. And, and guess what, you'll save a lot of money too once you stop smoking. Walk every day, you know, go for a walk. It's not that hard. If you have a dog, it's the easiest thing to do. You know, dogs love it. Even if you don't have a dog, go for a walk, you know. Hire a dog. Yeah, hire a dog, dog. yeah. It's, uh, you know, you don't have to run, you don't have to, you know, run a marathon. Just go for a walk. Walk for about 30 minutes. Now, if you have claudication, you may have to stop several times. That's okay. Now, don't walk through pain. When, just when you start to feel a little bit discomfort, wait, stop, wait for a few minutes, then walk again. So in a 30, 45 minute period, you may have to stop five times and that's fine. Because what happens is your body develops blood vessels around blockages the more you walk. So in a few weeks, you'll notice that you'll be able to walk further before you have to stop. So walking is very, very, very important. Stop smoking, walking. When you, when you have a small blockage causing claudication, if you change your lifestyle and go for walks, the disease may never progress because you will form blood vessels around that blockage enough that you'll be able to get around and do what you want to do every day. So, and those arteries are actually the, the helper arteries or collaterals, they're actually uh, uh, good arteries and they hardly ever form blockages within themselves. So, and that's, uh, that's, that's the way the body works is you, if you take care of yourself once the diagnosis is made, you could potentially avoid any kind of uh, intervention. Then aspirin, talk to your doctor. I don't want to, you to know, take an aspirin without talking to your doctor, but aspirin is a very useful drug, just like in heart trouble, taking aspirin is very helpful in stabilizing. If you have a blockage, it stabilizes your blockage. It prevents blockages from getting worse or forming you know, acute clots. So aspirin is a good drug provided you're safe to take aspirin. So, um, Again, uh, Kelly's done a great job talking about all these three things, but I just sort of mention it. High blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. You know, it's very important to control. That. So, um, yeah, uh, medical treatment obviously is very important to uh, prevent progression of the disease, but once you reach a point where um, the disease starts to bother you to the, you know, to the point of uh, preventing you from doing what you want to do every day, or, uh, you know, restricting your daily activity, or develop, you know, further disease like respiratory and tissue loss, then we start thinking of interventions, ways of um, treating the blockage. So endovascular treatment is, um, again, a, a way of uh, minimally invasive uh, treatment of the blockages. So getting a wire across through a needle hole either in either groin and then opening the blockage with the balloon or a stent. So this is how the stent looks like. And, um, and that's what we do in uh, endovascular. So Again, there are different gadgets out there. You know, it's a, it's a, the different ways of uh, treating blo blockages. We can remove blockages. We can uh, uh, put stents in or just do a balloon, depending on how the blockage looks like uh, in a given patient. Again, here you can see, you know, this is a blockage. Remember, I, I mentioned the fork in the road in the belly. So this is the, the one, the blood vessel going to the right leg, um, and uh, that is a stent and. Uh, and then this is the dye going through the stent. So, so it all depends on how much, how bad the blockage is affecting your life. So, if if the if you have like, if you have if your blockage is causing you pain on walking a couple blocks, uh, the first step is always medical treatment, control all the risk factors, and then you know we bring you back in a few months and see how you're doing. Uh, you may be doing better, or not. And if you're not doing better, then we start looking at intervention. So the first step is now, unless a patient comes to us with disease severe enough, advanced enough, that you know, we can't wait. If we do start medical treatment, but at the same time we go ahead and start thinking of intervention when it's in advance. So it depends on where in the spectrum of the you know, disease process a, a given patient is. Uh, but everybody has to get medical treatment, regardless of um, uh, pure medical treatment or surgery. Everyone has to get, you know, blood pressure control, stop smoking and all that. When we look at blockages on a, on a given study on a CAT scan or an angiogram, there are different things that we have to look for uh, in order to decide what the best treatment would be. And then there would be some situations where uh, trying to do something uh, where intervention was uh, endovascular or surgery um, 
may make things worse. Um, or if your symptoms are not bad enough, uh, your physician may choose to go with medical treatment first. So in, in medicine, whenever we try to decide a treatment, we look at the risk and benefit. So if uh, the, the benefit has to be more than the risk that we're going to put you through, especially with intervention. So if it's even same, usually we don't recommend the treatment, uh, unless it is life-saving. Like so I mean, there, there, are, there are situations when you know, we, uh, would, would, uh, it's in your best interest. Sometimes the disease can, uh, it, we can accelerate the disease process by intervening. Uh, that would be counterintuitive what we, you know, what we plan to do. But uh, sometimes this medical treatment is the best uh, thing to do. Um, unless uh, the disease starts to show signs of progression, that we have to intervene. The um, slide I was showing with all the uh, gadgets, there are gadgets in here that, um, let's see, th this is one of them, and uh, you know, this is one of them. So they're different, they're different, uh, and this one, this is probably the one you're talking about. So um, there are gadgets out there that take blockages out, but um, interestingly, and as physicians, we learned this over the last 10 years, the coronary blood vessels or the blood vessels of the heart are different from blood vessels out in the periphery. They react differently because these blood vessels in the legs are you know, between muscle compartments. They, have, they undergo different kinds of stress, unlike the heart blood vessels, so they respond different to treatments. So it's, it's still kind of a, um, a learning process for a lot of us in deciding what the best treatment would be. So this is an uh, example of a stent. Again, we can do uh, balloon work in the legs, you know, um, angioplasty. So again, there are different things we can do depending on you know, what kind of blockage and what, what, uh, uh, what the uh, symptoms are. Again, example of this is the fork in the road I was talking about. This is the artery coming up from the heart, splits like a fork in the road, one goes to each leg and these are bad blockages. And uh, once we uh, put stents in them, you know, open them up and uh, get more blood flow down to the foot. So if, if the um, endovascular or minimally invasive is not a good option, then we switch to surgery, where there are different things we can do in surgery. Again, surgery is not necessarily bad. <laughs> surgery sometimes may be the best treatment for you over you know, endovascular. So uh, just because you're needing surgery, it's not a bad thing, because that may be the quickest way to get rid of uh, your problem. So in surgery, one thing we, we can do is you know, uh, take the actual blockage out or uh, do a bypass, as Dr. Spratt was mentioning. Bypass is you know, uh, getting blood flow from above your blockage down to uh, below your blockage. Again, this is a bypass. This is a CAT scan of a patient who had a bypass in the leg. This is the thigh bone, femur. And you see this is a bypass graft going from above the blockage and going down to below the blockage. So this, this was the entire blockage, that there was no blood flow going. Again, there are different other blockages we get from you know, different parts of the body down to your leg. Uh, depending on um, you know what uh, needs to be done. So uh, that's about uh, peripheral arterial disease and blockages and uh, um, and this uh, medical endovascular stents and surgical options. I'm going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about veins and venous disease, and we'll talk about stockings. Uh, remember the initial slide we talked about what an artery is and what a vein is. So this is, this is all problem with arteries, right? carrying blood from the heart down to your legs. Now veins are what carry blood from your legs back to your heart. And um, before, okay, I got one more slide on arterial disease, we'll go over this. So again, it's, a, it's an indication that you may have a bigger problem if you have peripheral arterial disease. Could be having a problem with the heart or, um, or um, uh, uh, blood vessels to the brain. So recognizing this is important early on. And uh, initial treatment is always lifestyle modification and risk factor uh, uh, reduction. And uh, talk to your doctor if you have any questions, and you know we can uh, we can help you with that and uh, go from there. All right, varicose veins. Just a couple slides about veins so that you're aware of uh, venous disease. Uh, what are varicose veins? So these are dilated veins in the legs. These are caused due to uh, because the veins, unlike arteries, have to carry blood up against gravity towards the heart. They have one-way valves sitting in them. So, uh, and there are different valves at different levels in the leg. So the, as long as the blood is going up, the valve is open. The blood tries to come back down, the valve shuts. So this is normal. It prevents the blood from pulling down. Sometimes for uh, unknown reasons, uh, well, not totally unknown, some patients who stand on their feet for a long time, some familial component 
one or more of these valves may be leaking. They don't close properly. And that's when you get veins that dilate and you know, form varicose veins. And um, they may cause some achy discomfort and swelling in the leg. And uh, they do have a, a chance of causing blood clots in veins. And again, uh, over a period of time, uh, if it's there for a long time, you can have pain, swelling, and uh, darkish uh, discoloration, especially around the ankle on the inside. The skin can change color and uh, can form ulcers in a very late stages. You can have ulcers like this on the inside of the leg uh, from uh, vein problems. So where do we treat varicose veins? Obviously, there's always a cosmetic component to relieve pain, prevent bleeding, and prevent ulceration, you know, like we saw. Um, there's a, a procedure that we can do to close the vein. Now, uh, have you ever heard of stripping of the vein? So stripping of the vein was uh, what was done for varicose veins for years and years and years. You know, you, you're under anesthesia, we cut in the groin, cut down at the ankle, then we pass uh, what's called a stripper through the vein, tie it at one end, and pull the whole vein out through the other end. So now this, is, this procedure has replaced that. It's a, in a, a minimally invasive treatment where we just go down with one needle stick at the ankle, you know, just below the knee, and pass this catheter up, close the entire vein from inside, leaving the vein inside and just put a band-aid and you walk out of the office. It's an office-based procedure. So it's just like, you know, remember in the olden days how, it's, I say olden days, but when gallbladders used to come out with a big cut in the belly, and now we put four, three, actually now even two or three small video cameras and take the gallbladder out. So it's kind of similar to that. What effect would that have on returning the blood back to the heart? That's a very good question. So the, we do this only in veins that are not doing anything for you. These are veins that are leaking and actually so it's like uh, they're, they're preventing the other veins in the leg from doing the job. So they're increasing the pressure. That's what we call actually venous hypertension, where this vein is actually not working. It's just sitting there and pooling blood in the leg. So when we close this vein off, that's when the other veins actually work more effectively. So this is not a vein that's actually helping you. Again, if you need surgery, uh, this can be done uh, with uh, minimal incisions as well. So you know, the, at Penn we do, uh, take care of patients with peripheral arterial disease, varicose veins, stroke, aneurysms, and uh, thank you for coming today.